Sometimes having fun is the most responsible thing you can do. The new Volvo S60. Plug-in hybrid. For the road. For the planet. The moratorium has ended. Most retail stores are cash business and their survivability comes from the sale they make on a daily basis. For many, the MCO crippled them. For others, it was a chance to grow their business. And we're going to hear how these businesses took these challenges head on. Thanks for joining us on BFM Enterprise Back to Business webinars. This is the fifth of six webinars presented to you by Volvo Cars, Redefining Freedom to Move in a Personal, Sustainable and Safe Way. I'm Frida Liu. Uh, joining today on this topic of Maintaining cash flow and longevity are CK Chang from Ox White. Hi, CK. Hello. Hi, Frida. Hi. Uh, Andrew Yap from Book Access. Hi. Hi, everyone. And back by popular demand, uh, Mr. Tan Tiam Hock, serial <laughs> entrepreneur and BFM director. Hi. Hi, everybody. Okay, so of course, uh, the airport was with us six months ago when it all started. Um, I'm going to ask a question uh, right now, and this is for all of you. And of course, you know, we always say that cash is king, uh, but is that still true uh, during this pandemic? Uh, is there anything else that can ensure a company's longevity besides cash? Uh, I'm going to ask CK first. Sure, Frida. Um, I think for Oxwhite, uh, one thing besides the cash is we really invest a lot in brand love uh, from day one um, the product that we introduce and the customer experience that our customer are getting uh, are really top-notch is something they haven't seen before uh, that's why uh, a lot of people feel connected to the brand although we just sell basic essential items like shirts and t-shirts and underwear and we can see uh, customers uh, talking among themselves, uh, the Oxwhite customers that, wow, do you know I am purchased something for Oxwhite? And they are very happy to recommend our products to their friends and family. So uh, definitely uh, from day one, uh, when I started Oxwhite, uh, Elon Musk of Tesla, uh, Xiaomi of Leijin, uh, and Steve Jobs of Apple, these are the brand builders who are truly admired. So I, I just want to give the same brand love experience uh, to our customers here in Malaysia. Right. And like DK helps that, you know, because your business is always online. Yes. Right. Uh, Andrew, your story will be a bit different. Yeah. I think, um, you know, you know, you we many times you interview uh, us and then uh, I will always say that, you know, we always live for today, you know, and worry about tomorrow some other time, right? So I guess uh, this this pandemic has been a hard lesson for us, you know. And um, I think I mean cash is king, like basically. But then it's not everything, you know. So I mean, to me, basically, you know, what 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 does the company mean to the community is very important, right? And you know, uh, are you something that they can live without, right? So so we always made sure, you know, that uh, our product positioning is something which is is uh, very sustainable and needed by the the community, right? And, uh, you know, uh, the core of our business here in Google SS, you know, is always we present ourselves as a homegrown brand, you know, and how do we position ourselves within the reading landscape of Malaysia, you know? I mean, in short, you know, we are customer oriented and uh, we strongly believe that catering to our customers and growing organically within, with, with them, you know, as they grow up, you know, we are at every point, every part of our customer's life, you know, as a child, you know, all the way to adult. So, so I think that what you can mention, you know, the, the brand love and the brand awareness and, and what we uh, stand for, you know, is very important. You know? We want to become, you know, essential part of the community. So, and when you think about books, right, um, were you, was the ability to buy online also available? Um, yes. You know, prior to, 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 to MCO, you know, the pandemic and all, 
our online store was was just uh, 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 a very tiny uh, portion of business, not not significant at all. And uh, when when during the lockdown, we had a fifteen times uh, increase in online sales. Yeah, because everyone was bored at home. You know, the kids needed activities to do. You know, they can't be, be in front of a digital device all day long. So parents were looking for you know uh, books and activities uh, for the kids. Yeah. Right, Mr. Tan, your point of view. I've always been a firm believer in uh, branding. So I'm a consumer guy. So it's always been uh, branding. Um, during a recession like this, I think the the branding portion is uh, very comes in very useful. I'll give you an example: BFM as a brand, right? So everybody suffers for the two three months, but we bounce back very fast. So if you have a strong brand, right, you bounce back very fast. If your restaurant serve good food, reasonable price, you know, customers will come back. Uh, so a good brand is a, it's a big plus, right? I, I don't think it has anything to do with cash flow. You know, I think that's a separate issue, right? But just a good branding will always help in terms of a, a, a bounce back, you know, and more to back to business as usual right. you know that kind of stuff yeah. right. and of course you got to be relevant you know yes. you still have to be you know that's that's the important thing right uh so uh, many companies have pivoted during the pandemic there's that word again pivot um when is it necessary to pivot and when is it okay to hold and wait a little longer it's not at, at what point uh should that switch happen uh ck hmm. Uh, well, that's that's really relevant to Oxwhite uh, when I share this story. Um, Oxwhite started uh, with a single white shirt and selling exclusively online. And that's a pre-order model, which is a three months wait. So that was our first business model back then in June 2018. Uh, a year on, we still selling pre-order white shirts and still uh, three months wait and then we get a lot of feedback from customers look CK uh, I don't want to wait you know is there any way I can pay you more you get the shirts faster then we pivoted to have it ready stocks uh, then we invest into inventory and then we make sure the products arrive before we sell them then a year on after that uh, we pivot again uh, we know that we have the sales had hit a plateau uh, that we already can one guy can only buy so many shirts, formal shirts a year. So, and our customers say, CK, I have four to six, and sometimes we have customers have 12 shirts of our shirts. Then we realize that, oh, we have to do something, you know, to increase the sales. Then we start to introduce uh, uh, backpacks. And then what really caught us by surprise was we, we start pivoting into casual wear uh, last year, December. Okay, right before the MCO in a very, very small volume in about 1,000 pieces only, just a plain white shirt, a plain T-shirt. And that did really, really well for us. Uh, till today, uh, the casual wear has contributed, uh, I would say, more than 80% of our sales. So uh, uh, we have pivoted two times and that has served us well because based on data and based on observation, uh, that is really, really uh, help, help, help us. Right. And it, of course, it makes sense because people are working from home, needing less white sh colored shirts and needing more T-shirts, more casual wear. Yes, 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 yes. So in terms of casual wear, uh, in terms of pivoting as well, we keep trying. So because there are so many categories of casual wear, so and we do not know which one sell more because some, some things that are sell more in a retail shop, for example, bra. Right, uh, or, or from a pants, for example, people need to try on. But some other items are easier to sell, for example, underwear or t shirts. Uh, these are the items easier to sell online. So, uh, we keep learning and keep coming out of new product, and then we use the data whether can sell or cannot sell, and then we keep evolving from that because everybody needs underwear, yes, everybody <laughs> needs underwear. And, and, <laughs> Andrew, what did you do? Nothing. <laughs> you did no pivoting at all. <laughs> so okay, so basically, I think for us, um, you know, we a big bag wolf and book access started off 
you know, in Malaysia. In 2016, we went overseas and, you know, um, at that time, you know, when we were just in Malaysia, it was always a, uh, a worry, you know, that, oh, what happens, you know, politically or economically, there's a problem, you know, you know, what will happen to our business, you know, always had that worry, right? And the 2016, we actually went out of Malaysia, you know, Indonesia, Thailand, and then uh, up to uh, prior to the pandemic, we were in 11 different countries, you know, 32 cities around the world. So we were just, you know, not worried at all because it's like, you know, how, how can you be worried when, when you have, you know, uh, businesses all around the world in the Middle East, uh, 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 Asia and all in so many different countries, right? Something can happen here, you know, you have another, you know, uh, uh, 12 markets out there, right? Something can happen in Taiwan, you know, you, you're safe in other countries in the Middle East. So so we, we, we never really had any, you know, plans or contingency plans. It's just that we were just chugging along, growing growing the business. And when, when this uh, pandemic came, you know, everything grinded to a halt, literally. You know, we are event-based uh, uh, company and it's, it's like, you know, like the airline industry, you know, it's, mm. it's there's or the travel industry is is it's hard for them to find uh to see 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 the future uh right and for us you know you don't know what's going to happen you know in the, uh, in the next two years because it events we rely on heavy crowds and all right so uh what we did uh definitely we accelerated all our future plans you know the online plans uh to today uh i think basically the pandemic you know it's the best thing that ever happened to our company but of course, yes, it's hell at the moment, you know, trying to pivot, right? Uh, but we can see a much, much, much better future uh, once we are able to turn things around. And we started the, the, the pivot uh, right around uh, March when things started uh, to get bad, right? You know, and uh, so uh, uh, instead of, of, of just uh, uh, sitting down and seeing what happened, we all grouped together, you know, day and night, you know, just uh, sitting down and find a solution and how we can 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 accelerate all our plans and we did have plans you know but uh, it wasn't concrete so we used that time to to really uh, lay out the plans and then start, things started moving forward in march uh, uh no, sorry, april may june onwards and um we have successfully turned the whole company around to be an e-commerce uh, company we were so physical we were so old school you know you know i mean world's biggest book sale you know the bookstores were were large everything was just so physical but we didn't have an online presence and there was also a reason why we didn't have an online presence because all the markets that we are going to right uh, they haven't fallen in love with books yet you know and so if you haven't fallen in love with books you do not go and buy books online you go and buy books online when you you know uh, what specifically that you want so um, i mean thank god that uh, you know the last uh, 10 years we were seeding all the markets that we were you know including malaysia and overseas with, with books introducing books to the masses right and um so the moment uh, uh uh they couldn't go to a bookstore or they couldn't get books from the sale they could get from get it from us right. online but we did not have the online platform so right. overnight right. we had to turn the whole warehouse and all into a in basically into an e-commerce uh business yeah. Right. But what was interesting was that you were planting the seed, right? Uh, you planted the seeds anyway. Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, Mr. Tan, I know there was some serious pivoting going on where you were, you know, um, where you were. Um, I think pivoting is something that uh, is included in the long term plans of many companies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, e commerce, everybody say, oh, we must be e commerce and stuff like that. Um, so for us, consumer goods at that time, e-commerce demand was just not there. We still be very dependent, uh, cosmetic business still on Watsons, Guardians, mm. and stuff like that. Even the big brands like ST Lauder and all was very much department store, and then they setting up their own retail outlets, and still very event uh, related. They will invite customers to a launch of a new products and stuff like that. Um, recently, of course, it's being forced, you know. This pandemic has forced, uh, with the closure of outlets and all that, uh, uh, and the customers re uh, fearful of going out to shop, uh, has been forcing uh, most companies to go online as far as trading is concerned. Uh, but I still see that, you know, you're still going to be very dependent on the, uh, on the uh, uh, retail outlets and all, uh, because it's a shopping habit, you know. Um, and 
those days we used to project project that you know in few years time uh online business will be 30 percent right of the cosmetic business and 70 percent will still be in retail mm -hmm. um i think it's still true now even though the the online sales have picked up a lot uh it's double triple five times ten times but the it starts from a very small base right oh. So it will take time for it to go more full steam into it. Uh, right. You just don't get the, uh, what do you call that, the, the merchandising feel, the brand feel, you know. When you go and go in front of a counter, you get to see all the products, you know, you get to touch it and stuff like that. Uh, online, is just scrolling down the pages, right? There's no emotion. There's no impulse, you know, impulse. So you're just buying things, uh, you know, as it is. So it will never take over the total retail experience, right? Uh, Big Bad Wolf is a very, very uh, uh, drastic pivot, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're depending on a lot of the sales on your book uh, exhibitions, right? And it's, I, I remember, you know, you, are, you used to have very big sales every time you have an exhibition in Mid Valley or something like that. And that then you're forced to go into online. Uh, it will never be the same. You know, you can never get back that kind of volume, right? Despite being going online, um, so it's 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 something about pivoting where you will have to do what you call a hybrid model, right? You plan for a hybrid model. You still need the retail. You need still need to do the exhibitions. You need to do the events. At the same time, you know, you you keep growing your online sales, and companies who have started planning that three years ago. Five years ago, we'll find it less difficult now to go online, you know, right, right to act activate their online activities. But those companies who have refused to change, who have refused to look into that, now they're stuck. And you cannot just say, I want to go online means in three months' time, I'm online, you know. It doesn't work that way, right? Huh? Right. So, you know, so Padini is having a tough time now, right? Yeah. Because Padini is very much, uh, uh, you know, casual wear retail concepts, big brand stores, outlets and stuff like that. Uh, then, but with China coming in, with Alibaba coming in with their uh, DFTZ, uh, they are going to be under a lot of pressure because they're going to stock up all these Chinese-made T-shirts and everything and they're going to flog the market at 990, you know? That, right. that kind of stuff. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Right. So what, what does Padini need to do now? Because they are selling the same T-shirts for 1990. To the Malay market, let's just say as an example, mm, okay. Right. And the online is going to come in at nine ninety. So when do they pivot? You know what? What are they going to mm. do to defend, right? Mm. So you all you see is over the years you see the erosion, right, of your market share in the retail segment going over to the e-commerce uh, side. Right. So I, I, you know, when do you pivot? I I think you you have to start pivoting now, three right. years ago. Five years ago, you know, uh, it's not something that uh, because the pandemic causes it. Of course, it hastened the whole effect, right? Because some companies just gone to a, uh, you know, just totally lost the whole business, you know, right? Yeah, and and it's scary mm -hmm. right now because it's, we're seeing the second wave uh, affecting malls again. So that's also something that you know your your thoughts around that maybe Tiam Hock. Uh, <sighs> Three months ago or six months ago, when I started talking about cash flow, right? When we saw the thing coming in, the pandemic coming in, I was really talking about cash flow. And then this this fear of, uh, we have seen the last six months, there's going to be a stop, go, stop, go kind of uh, business environment, right? So... We flattened this curve. Now we flattened the curve. The confidence came back. Just as when people are starting to go out and enjoying and grouping together, and the business started coming back, you know, maybe not to hundred percent. Most businesses back to 60, 70 percent, eighty percent, right? So we could leave again, so to speak. Right. Then this fear now starts coming again, uh, and the same thing goes on. So it will be another one month, two months of fear until we flatten this curve. And then, you know, we just have to learn to live with it. But it's going to be a stop-go, stop-go kind of uh, environment. 
Right. right. Now, right. For everyone watching, you can post your questions on the FB comment section and we'll get to them later. Uh, for those who have just joined us, this is the BFM Enterprise Back to Business webinar series brought to you by Volvocast. And we're talking about maintaining cash flow and longevity. Now, what should businesses, especially cash dependent ones, right, factor in to stabilize their cash management right now and beyond? Because, you know, we were talking as well that the moratorium has ended. Uh, CK, your thoughts? Well, uh, Frida, for Oxide, we are extremely, extremely lucky. Uh, we know that uh, from December uh, quarter four last year, 2019, we know that you know we're going to stock up more inventory for sell as ready stock instead of pre-order. Uh, cash would be the king, and we need a lot of cash. And back then, uh, business is still very young, less than two years old. Bank turns it off. Uh, you know, uh, then. Uh, we are lucky that, that through friend introduction, we uh, approach to equity crowdfunding uh, through that channel. Uh, in less than two months, we able to raise uh, 5 million cash. Uh, so by January 2020, the 5 million cash was sitting in the bank account and it's ready for us to, to really buy more products uh, and then able to sell to our consumers. So I would say anticipating... Uh, what would be coming and mm -hmm. for, for businesses that are short in cash right now, uh, definitely if you have a good business model and of course you have your fan base, uh, right. you will be never short of accessing equity if the banks are turning you off. Uh, always equity crowdfunding, they welcome you and now businesses can raise up to 10 million, 10 million. Uh, so that will be a big help and big boost for businesses, uh, especially SMEs. And of right. course, uh, raising funds through equity crowdfunding uh, you as a business owners, you make your own terms. If right. your investors think they're going to buy in, they will buy in. So it's very favorable for business to consider uh, right. if you type on cash. Thank you. Right. And that's a very good point, right? And but you you mentioned that you have a fan base, you know, your brand is known, that kind yeah. of thing. So with that, it was easier with equity Much crowdfunding. Easier. Much easier, yes. right? Um, Much easier. And, and I I have seen a restaurant, Frida, selling a sourdough bread sourdough mm. bread specialized in sourdough bread and this lady was an old lady about 50 to 60 years so a couple of them based in penang penang uh, with that recipe and only two outlets at the time which is they own a cafe and sell sourdough bread they raised one million during mco right one million so it is definitely uh, something is eye-opening because they have their fans uh, mm -hmm. that people love the sourdough bread will support them so mm -hmm. i i truly believe it's beyond you have to do retail business or you know you have to do online business i think any business model that as long as you have very good fan base and you serve your customer well they will support you especially in this time right uh andrew i guess i think uh um ck has covered a lot of the the important points right uh, I would just like to, to, to say that I think uh, from what we have learned personally, uh, because we never factored this one very important thing was uh, that I think right now, uh, I mean, I would say that uh, every company should have at least a minimum of six months cover you know, of their OPEX, right? And uh, 12 months would be best, right? But I think it's, it's almost not easy to have a 12 month cover, right? But anything between six months and 12 months would, would be perfect, you know? And, uh, you know, we get to do things like, you know, stabilizing our operations, you know, the supply chain of the physical goods, you know, uh, got to take in, uh, you know, uh, geographical uh, labor disruptions, you know, manufacturing disruptions, suppliers and all, taking all this in, 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 into, uh, in, I mean, all these aspects, right? And then building the contingency plans, you know, especially operational plans, you know, uh, labor, labor is one, one, one big, uh, uh, factor and in terms of uh, capex right and the thing is uh, having variable labor staffing is very important so uh, you know we are trying to, to use a lot of uh, either casual or part-timers or, or, or contract staff because when 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 things get go crazy again if it i mean touch it doesn't right at least you can pare down uh, very quickly and then you know um, planning urgent costs uh, cost takeouts uh you know uh pulling the handbrakes you know on 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 hiring freeze you know opex capex and everything else you know i mean uh preparing you know very aggressive uh you know 
break glass cost actions like even like in the office uh we even we even stop providing milo you know to the extent right, right? yeah we get to do everything everybody bring bring your own milo to to, to work now your own coffee you know yeah no wonder the sales drop lah. yeah <laughs> we stop I mean, getting break we stop getting breakfast yeah yeah i mean planning meet them you know uh 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 um, uh, okay, back and 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 OPEX and all also very important, right? And then uh, you know, especially in terms of cash, also I mean, drawing down on um, credit lines, you know, from banks and and you know, to add to to cash flow balance sheets, you know, to guarantee our liquidity is also very important. Whatever that we can we can we can hold, right? And um, I think modeling different um, scenarios, you know, uh, in terms of supply chain disruption, uh, revenue decline, and all that kind of thing, you know, outlining all the major operational actions that you know that would trigger all these kind of things so yeah so these are the many little things that everyone should do you know and then you know play play offensive and not just uh, uh defensive you know right. when it comes to you know uh, competitors you know and, and how we see the market especially because you get to bring in as much uh revenue as possible yeah. right but now the, the, now's the time to be offensive huh? uh yeah. you know, actually one of the things i think preparing for to bounce back also, it's very important when you bounce right. back and then you're ready, but then you cannot be too optimistic also, mm -hmm. right? So, so all these uh, 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 factors, you know, uh, uh, have to be thought about on, on, on uh, you know, how, how do we stabilize, you know, uh, for the next year at least, yeah. Right. Uh, Tiam Um. Well, CK is very lucky, he managed to raise money just before the, you know, pandemic. Right. Uh, not everybody is so lucky. I think you must be one of the one out of the million. Um, yes. Andrew Yap's uh, uh, comment on having at least six months uh, OPEX. Um, six months have passed. Mm. Right. Six months have passed. Um, two to three months have been total write offs. Right. Basically, April, May, maybe to for some people, June even. In UK, you know, the restaurants have been closed for five months. Five months. Totally no cash flow, nothing. So now you look back and say, oh, you know, six months cash flow preservation is barely enough, right? And then what happens to all those uh, stocks that you're carrying that you have to pay the bank, right? That you've used bank money to borrow and to pay for the stocks and everything. So looking at immediate needs, you know, it's, it's like, Cash flow is like at this moment here. If you have borrowing from the bank, take advantage of it. You know, it's the once in a lifetime by the banks to extend because it's forced onto them by Benagara, right? The systemic risk of uh, a sudden jump in the NPL, right? It's it's a, a very concern. You know, it's very concerning. You know, especially by Benagara. So they are pushing the banks to help out everybody extend the loan structure, extend everything, you know, so that you can afford to pay them the interest. The second you don't pay them the interest portion, even you become an MPL, right? right? And the banks have very strict rules to classify MPL. So these rules are now being loosened by Ben Agara in, the, in terms of interpretation and everything, just to prevent, you know, a sudden spike in MPL. Despite that, it's still going to be a substantial chunk going to happen over the next three months okay if your company has got these loans with the bank whether you're doing well or you're not doing well doesn't matter it's a great opportunity to extend your cash flow as long as possible as long as the bank allows you to do it take the opportunity because it's the one that's in a lifetime offer mm. and you're right. not sure what's going to happen in the next 12 months or you know or 18 months even right, right? Does it, it's going to be stop, go, stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. So you, you're you going to have a very uneven cash flow coming in, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. right? uh, sudden change, you know, you can just change the the, the buying patterns, the, you know. And then some people, they're, they're, once they're worried about their salary and everything, right, they get cuts and everything, they cut down on the unnecessary stuff. Why do I need to have 12 shirts now? All right, four white shirts is more than enough. I don't even go to office, so I don't need a working shirt. All right, I'm more into casual wear now, you know, at home, you know, and I have a lot of t shirts, right? Everybody has a lot of t shirts. So if I don't need to buy, I don't buy. 
No, but these are fears, right? These are yeah, consumer yeah. change in consumer behavior, right? That we have to be worried about. You right. know? Mm. Right. Okay. Previous you... last 10, 15 years has been a lot of what you call excessive buying. Mm. Okay? okay. Right? right. So like Frida, how many pairs of shoes did you buy? You know, right? How many bags have you bought? Right. Now you say maybe okay, I can hold on, right? I don't need I still have so many bags. Some of the shoes I haven't even worn it yet. Correct? Mm -hmm. So it's time to take this up. But then I'm not going to work, right? I'm half the time I'm at home. So I don't need these shoes, you know? Right? So there's a sudden there's a sudden drop, right, in many, many consumer products. Right. Okay. Already okay. a lot of my factory friends, they have their had their orders, right? Pushed mm -hmm. to next year. They were supposed to be delivered this year, the last quarter, next quarter, right? It's been pushed to next year. You know? So suddenly they have lost in production because it's all planned into the production. They have bought the raw materials, and then the customer say, "Hold it, you know, deliver to me in January, February, March, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Where's the cash flow coming from, right? To pay for the raw materials, you know, in the store and everything. It's okay, so really tough. We've okay? we've got it's a really tough. Yeah. We've got a couple of questions. I want to address this one because, you know, it's, it's uh, and of course, we'll get to the others as well. This one, Christine, you and we're talking about cash flow and, uh, you know, maintaining cash flow and longevity, which is also the other thing that people are thinking, talking about is uh, environmental sustainability, right? And mm. so you've got to balance that, right? So how, uh, you know, are you taking in secondhand goods or reuse uh, other products or resell, you know, that, that sort of thing? Are we looking, are we concerned about these things that, you know, uh, now right now as we're trying to survive. Um, and this is actually addressed to Andrew and CK, um, but of course, you know, Tiam Ho can also uh, comment. Um, hmm. CK, anything to add? Well, uh, sustainability has been a big part uh, hmm. from the year two when we start doing the business. So uh, we are committed uh, as we post in our community group and all our newsletter. So uh, we started with quality in terms of sustainability first. Uh, we sure all the product we source uh, are sustainable and then uh, they are good in quality so they have a longer shelf life, that's to begin with. And we also look into packaging of the products. So uh, if you realize uh, now uh, half of our t-shirts that we produce are back in paper bags. So never before you've seen a lot of uh, shirts, they always wrap in plastic bag. And, and we pay 10 times more uh, for the cost of bag to be back in the recycled paper bags. And right. also uh, we develop more products that are sustainable. Uh, for example, for our laundry uh, uh, detergents, uh, they are eco-friendly. So this is part of our efforts to be sustainable. So uh, we first look at the source of the product, the material, and also the packaging go with it and the quality. So we add uh, longevity for the products. So, so we don't lose sight of these things. Uh. Uh, yes. Anyone anyone else got anything to add to that? If not, uh, we've got a lot. I've still got a lot of questions and then there are questions coming in. So, but anyway, I'm going to ask this to, to Andrew as well, right? We're talking about longevity. So your company's lifeline, we, we addressed this, was threatened with the annual Big Bad Wolf uh, sale being disrupted this year. So can the online space, uh, can it compensate for the loss of the physical event like that? Yes, I think for us, uh, definitely. And, and uh like I mentioned just then, uh, we started our efforts in March, April already, right, to totally become an e-commerce giant, right? And mm -hmm. we built the world's biggest book sale, you know, in many countries, you know, and, and this same team, you know, is going to build the world's biggest, uh, you know, online uh, platform or most affordable platform. Right? And uh, so we've been working seriously, tirelessly over the last uh, three to four months, right? We have a fantastic team with us doing it. And we got a kick-ass website right now. And we just launched Thailand last month, uh, Big Bad Wolf Thailand. And it's like a flash sale kind of thing, just like Big Bad Wolf, you know, uh, over two weekends and things like that. Currently, um, Sri Lanka uh, is going on and in Indonesia too, right? So, um, of course, like what uh, uh, Tiam Hong uh, mentioned, you will, you cannot see uh, the kind of numbers that you will have uh, uh, during the uh, offline sale. You know, uh, it's probably about a quarter of what you actually collect or even one-fifth. But here's the amazing thing, you know, your cost totally goes down when you do online. You know, you don't have to rent a whole, you don't have to hire, you know, a thousand part-timers, right? You don't have to move the books, you don't have to bring back the books. So 
So um, the the amazing thing is what we can do online is that we can do it, you know, three or four times a year. Because right. if you do an offline right. event, you can only do it once a year, right? Mm-hmm. If you, you can afford to do it only once a year because of the cost factors involved, right? Mm-hmm. So with online, you can do it four times. And customer can spread their buying because it's, you know, a uh, 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 customer will generally need, I mean, with kids, right, you know, 30 to 40 books uh, 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 a month if you have a whole family, right? Uh, uh, and how many books can you buy uh, from a sale, right? So if you're if you're coming back every quarterly, you can see newer books, you know, and then you can straight out your budget too. You can't buy a whole year's worth of books in in, in one event. So so the advantage of going uh, uh, online is that we can do it as and when we want, as long as we can have a decent uh, volume. So our first try in Thailand alone, uh, we had almost twelve thousand orders, uh, uh, you know, and and um, Sri Lanka has already uh, gone past fifteen thousand orders, right? So and it just in a matter of days, right? So, yeah, um, I think online uh, uh, is, is the way to go for us and we can do a lot more activities and, and, and engage with our customers a lot online too. But definitely the goal is to do a hybrid like what Tianhua mentioned, to do an online, offline event at the same time. Yeah. So I had a question for CK, but I think you addressed it earlier on already, you know, like obviously less working shirts, more casual clothes, right? Uh, this is a question from Benny and also Idham. It's about, um, I'm, I'm going to combine them together. It's about brand positioning. It's about understanding consumers' uh, buying behavior. So um, Benny, we said that and Idham also, uh, can the panel elaborate on current customer buying behavior in response to COVID-19 and how entrepreneurs should respect, respond to this behavior based on their, you know, your experience? Uh, who would like to take that? Uh, maybe Andrew? We'll take, you know. I think from, from the, the, the um, you know the brand perspective right um positioning i mean yourself you know ask yourself your, your own company right uh like what i mentioned just then you know, what what do you mean to the people you know uh, to the community right are you part of their lives you know and so if if you're not you know try to 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 be that part of them you know just like how how like you know milo and all this is everyone grew up in milo right so mm. try try to be a brand that that uh, uh you know we all we uh, i mean try to be a homegrown brand that that people grew up with mm. okay uh and nobody else anything to add then this is a question for tiam Hock. so uh so many smes have chosen to extend the moratorium and enter the targeted repayment assistance uh till december so what kind of strategies should they employ when negotiating an extension with the banks and uh yeah and do you think this is healthy financial dependence uh, I don't think you have a choice, right? Yeah. You know, so um, if you want to talk to the bank, then you better do your cash flow. Okay. Do your cash flow forecasting uh, based on the business that you have. Mm. Um, I mean, we recently we sent out these uh, uh, templates being done by uh, my friends in uh, Ernst and Young, mm. right, to help the SMEs. And that's the reason because when I talk to the senior bank officials, they say, you're already my customer, right? That's why we loan you these facilities, the banking facilities. And now you're in trouble, but we need to know how bad your situation is and how do you see the next 12 months? They only want to know the next 12 months, right? Then they can help you plan because their limitation is to extend it, you know, into three months, six months, nine months, 12 months extension kind of uh, Period. Right, just to make it easier for you. Sometimes they can make let you pay interest only and then pay the principal later. You know, sometimes they can extend it, you know, by adding on six months to the end of the thing. So, you know, six months or 12 months kind of stuff. So these are, I wouldn't say strategies, you know, in I think you just have to be honest with them. Uh look at your do your spreadsheet, do your cash flows. Uh try to do a decent forecast right. right if you tell them oh i'm totally out of cash they just close you down they just ask you to pay back and then straight away you go into mpl but neither would i advise you to go and put some crazy projections and say i'm going to be back to my normal you know which is not possible they know that 
So something in the region of I'm going to get back my 50% of my sales, 70% of my sales, you know, kind of a, a projection, yeah. which they will take it with a pinch of salt, but they are right. there to help you. Right. That's my thinking. So right. as long as you can do a proper projection and then the OPEX comes in because you have to show a lower OPEX mm. to reflect, you know, as a percentage of your sales, right? If your sales drop by 30%, Technically speaking, your OPEX should drop by 30%, right? Or else your cash flow won't match. Right. The cash flow just won't match, mm -hmm. right? And you have to be... If you have over-ordered, then you will be in a big, bigger, bigger, bigger trouble, right. you know? It all depends on what you're holding, uh, what's the business in the you know, business. I mean, tourism, nobody will believe you. So all the banks will reject all this restructuring, right? They are going to MPL. Those who who who, who are in tourism and everything, right? You mm. see Asia, X, Asia, all in deep shit. Mm. Right? And so are all the all, all the other airlines worldwide, right? Singapore Airlines raised eight billion cash. Four million, four billion in terms of Tamase putting in four billion Sing dollars. And they went and borrowed four billion from DBS, which gave them a line. And half of this was spent in two months. Right. Half of that was spent in two months. Because you need to pay for the installment for your planes, right? Mm. MAS now says after November, I can't pay, you know, my mm. my thing. AHOX already stopped paying, mm. asking everybody to take a big haircut, you know. Mm. So, in the sense that uh, if your business is still salvageable, do a proper forecast, you know, cash flow forecast for the next 12 months mm. and reasonably go and sit down with them. Mm. And they will then, then the officers will then go to the loan committee and they will give you some, some form of existence, whether to, to the kind of uh, 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 length that you want and the amount to be payable. Be honest with them. I can't pay the full sum now. I can only pay this portion, you know, over the next three months, four months, because I'm expecting collection from here and there, that kind right. of stuff. I'm converting this to when, you know. So then the cash flow will come in a bit more later. Then they will help you adjust. Mm. As long as they don't, you know, they give you a chance to recover. That right. That is the key thing. Huh? Okay. And you, you have to do it next 12 months. Because right. it's going to be stop, go, stop, go, yeah. and yeah. you cannot predict. Right. So how to do cash projections? Stop go, stop go. Anyway. <laughs> no lah, you just do. You just do, <laughs> right? Be reasonable. You do, right? I mean, last mm. few months has been good, so you can see when the confidence comes back what it's like. Mm. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is going to be the final question. Um, mm. Expansion during a crisis, right? So some say that a crisis is the best time to expand and take risks. Others are more risk averse. So what's your take on this? Uh, CK? Uh, Frida, we, we definitely see this at the opportunity for Ox, right? Mm -hmm. um, our sales uh, from beginning of the year uh, keep going up month month on month mm. and so far this is a uh, like the month of september is our best month ever since we started uh that contribute partly because we produce more relevant products to our consumers uh like andrew say you become every part of their life uh like milo for example so uh the core of that is continue to produce good quality product that is a core and make sure it's affordable so in terms of uh, our business uh, direction uh, affordably is a key part so uh, we are introducing a lot more products they are priced below 50 ringgits so right. average Malaysians still you know they're addicted to shopping they still can get something nice for themselves uh, that is what we are going so in in terms of uh, opportunity uh, how I see it is that um, we must use this uh, to to do what beyond what we are comfortable at doing. For example, uh, going forward to quarter four, you know, uh, we will have uh, the next product we're going to launch is the reusable mask. Okay. So it's something is in the pipeline, but we are not selling this mask. We are not selling those. So we are throwing in to every orders. Uh, 
uh, that customer make the purchase. So that increased the sales. And also, we know that a lot of our consumers would have children at home and mm. our masks are made to very high breathability. So we will have children masks for the first time ever. So even we don't sell children clothes, but this mask, the parents will buy and then they have something right. for the kids right. and they can use it at the school because kids need a very good breathable mask. If not, they will not wear them. So right. uh, we make something more relevant and right. then something they want. Right. And, and this was uh, my question about expansion and also, you know, uh, that element of also future proofing, right? Uh, which yes. Is great. And, and I, I'm thinking Milo should be paying us because like, we said them a few times. Right? <laughs> uh, <Yes. laughs> Andrew, your, your thoughts about expansion during a crisis and also future proofing. Yeah, right? I think COVID is basically an unprecedented event, you know, uh, and this and any event like this will always provide great opportunities. Uh, and if you can just find the silver lining, right, and... Uh, it is actually a very good time to me personally to expand also, right? But of course, uh, do it carefully, you know. It's a good time to strike deals because, you know, landlords, you know, suppliers and all, they, they, they are so unsure of, of what's going to happen. But if you can give them just some little bit of visibility, you know, and commit a little bit, but make it variable, you know, if, 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 if the pendulum swings, right? So this is the basically the best time to plan for the next two years, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's something like hedging in a way, right? So mm. I think, uh, yeah, so that, that, that to me would be, and, and it is okay. definitely time to, 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 to expand. Yeah. Right. And in your case, you've been a little bit offensive as well in terms of, you know, marketing and that sort of thing, right? I mean, uh, I mean, I guess that's what it means, right? To be an entrepreneur, there's also a little bit of that risk-taking involved, right? Mm. Uh, Mr. Tan, <laughs> to close off this. Uh, uh, I really think moving. about it. You know, but uh, this uh, the there are two types of expansion, right? Mm. One is expansion within your business, so your business is actually shrinking, has shrunk. Last six months has shrunk, except for CK's business, which was strictly online. So those who are on online like Shopee and Lazada and all, they have seen a tremendous increase, right? So they have actually expanded. So they. You know, doing more and more things and stuff like that, right? They're expanding into live streaming and stuff like that now. Then there's the traditional business where all of us have seen a drop, right? Minimum 50%. Minimum, you know, for six months, for the three, four months, it was minimum drop uh, 50%. Uh, some have recovered back to just up to 70% of what they used to do. So I don't know what you mean by expansion within the business. You know, you're just trying to recover back things like that. Um, but for those who think that this is the right time to continue to launch relevant products for the market, right? Uh, then it's sort of like a little bit of pivoting into new products. You know, to expand your sales, so to speak, lah. Right. right? Uh, the main opportunity actually is in the expansion of uh, in the industry. For those who are uh, well financed, those who have the money, this is a good time to look into your competitors. This is a good time to look into uh, acquiring uh, competitors or relevant synergistic, you know, companies that gives you synergy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that that is interesting part. Okay. Because once once this thing tied over, you are able to buy some new assets, you know, uh, which will be very useful to you, correct? Right? Going forward, you know, uh, in the thing, and then you will pick up is much faster, you know, you're more integrated. It all depends, okay. Right. And the the right time to expand is now actually if you intend to buy, because the prices are like you know, nobody is shouting crazy valuations anymore. Mm. Right? Mm. Nobody is shouting crazy valuations anymore. Everything comes back to basic, you know, how you're going to do, you know, how much uh, profit you're making, that kind of stuff. Back mm. to reasonable PEs, EBITDA, PEs, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's a good time to expand in that sense mm. if you have the cash. And if you see that the business will survive through this period, mm. the, the target market, you know, that, that you are looking at. So that, that's on the expansion side. 
Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your thoughts and thank comments you. and all the questions that have come through. Uh, thank you to CK Chang from Oxwhite, uh, Andrew Yap from Book Access, Mr. Tan Tiam Hock, uh, Serial Entrepreneur and BFM Director. And of course, this webinar series was brought to you by Volvo Cars, Redefining Freedom to Move in a Personal, Sustainable and Safe Way. Uh, our next and final webinar is happening on social enterprises, how they aid in the sustainability journey. And that will be moderated by Richard Bradbury. Happening next Thursday, uh, 15 October, 1.30 p.m. So we also would appreciate your feedback. So the link is posted in the comment section. Five questions only. So we'd like to know how we can do this better. So until next week, thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, everyone, thank for you. joining us. Thank Bye, Wobo <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Hello. Bye. Hello.